Well, hey everybody, welcome back to Hanging Out with Successful Bar Exam Takers. And we have a special treat today because we have a two-time successful celebration bar review taker. Um, I think spread out over a period of maybe three or four years. But with us today is Patricia Farron. Hi, Patricia. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm thinking you're feeling pretty good though right now yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you just recently found out that you passed the District of Columbia, which is the uniform bar exam. Um, so you took the DC bar this July, 2017, and you took the Florida bar exam uh, for the last time in February, 2014. And I say the last time because you didn't pass on your first try in Florida, correct? Yeah, that was the third time taking Florida. Okay. And, but on DC in the UBE, this was your first time, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I would love to have you tell our audience a little bit about your background and your story and what caused you to sit for the Florida bar exam and then a few years later to uh, take another bar. All right, so I graduated law school in 2012 um, and then decided I took the bar the first time with a big box bar review and I did not pass. Um, the second time I went to you and I was working full time <laughs> while studying for the Florida bar exam and I wasn't successful. And then the third time we finally got it. And that's actually also, I did not have accommodations the first two times. Um, I had accommodations in law school but because I didn't need them for the MPRE, for some reason, that was something Florida was like, you're not getting them for this. Um, and then we appealed and it took about a year and a very long process um, to get that done. But I got the accommodations, which was just time and a half in a distraction reduced setting. Um, and I passed and I got like a 155 on the MBE for that. Yeah, yeah I want, I just, just stop for a minute, folks. She got a 155 on the MBE. Um, which is, you know, <laughs> that was quite a success story. And you were kind enough back then. You were kind of shy, actually. You were kind enough, though, back then, instead of doing an interview, you did a video for us and you talked about yeah. your result. And that video has been watched by thousands and thousands of people. And we got a lot of reaction to it. And people were like, I want to I want to know more about that woman that got the 155 on the MBE. Um and that was really something because you were working full time and you did have, uh, you know, a, a ADHD, I think, was the the, the yeah. accommodation. Uh, and, so you got time and a half, right? Yeah, and anxiety disorder. So that convention center with five thousand other examinees just was not yeah. going to work. And they like to tell you to keep covering your paper in the middle of the exam in Florida. Yeah, the proctors walk by and tell you to cover it, and you're like, you just took me out of the zone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a lot of anxiety. And, and for you, that was really debilitating. And so we worked on some techniques to help you kind of control that and get get ready. And then your confidence just got bigger and bigger and better and better. We got the accommodations that was about a year, I guess now thinking back to it, it was really quite a process. They uh, told us in December. In yeah, the nice before the, the end February of test. December. It was about New Year's when they told us so it was already just a month to go. And yeah, that's when they like, said they got them. And you've been practicing under regular time conditions because we didn't think you were going to necessarily get the accommodation. So it was like Valhalla when we got it. And you went in and you took that exam and you knocked it out of the park. I mean, it was sweet, sweet, sweet. And we were very excited about that for you. And it was a great, a great result. Well, we fast forward a couple of years. Why are you taking the DC bar in 27, 2017? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had some friends who have just graduated law school and they started take, talking about the UBE, the uniform bar exam, which really started in, I think about 2011, if I'm yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated in 2012 um, and took the exams in 12 and 13, like it wasn't something that was going, it wasn't very popular. It was only in the Northwest. Um, right. And then last year, I think, New York adopted it, and then New Jersey adopted it, and more and more states have adopted this. So for me, I decided to take it just as a, just a, like a stepping stone professionally because it gives me ability to wave into other states. Um, yeah. Florida has no reciprocity um, for anyone that's a Florida <laughs> taker, so it's kind of limiting if you find a great job in a state where you could wave in if you had another bar, um, yes. but you can't for Florida. So I decided to take it for that reason. Um, and I took DC because um, I think their UBE score was not that crazy. And I figured most people wave into DC, so it'd be 
less examinees sitting for it. Yeah, I want to I want to focus on that point for just a minute. A couple of things. One is DC requires a 266 scaled score, which is the same score as New York and New Jersey. So it's not an easy number. It's not the lowest UBE passing score. So there were jurisdictions clearly with lower scores. But I think what, what you did that was so wise, Patricia, was that you recognized, and I think we had some communication about this, that DC was a smaller bar. And so the anxiety part, the the 5,000 people in Florida, in Tampa, in the one room with the, the baffles and the winds blowing and the armored truck and the pat down before you walk in and the clock that's invisible. And I mean, all of the crazy stuff they do in Florida. And I'm not exaggerating, by the way, folks, that's that's the real deal. Uh, the DC is a much, much smaller bar. Now, I'm not going to claim that they're well run because <laughs> they're not, but uh, <laughs> but they are really much more uh, informal and way, 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 way by like a, a factor of 10 times smaller, right? Was that your experience? Yeah, I, I did decide on them just strategically. I could have easily taken it in South Carolina, which is yeah. also, I think, a 266 or New York or New Jersey, but I knew those jurisdictions would have far more examinees. Yeah. Um, and since this was my second bar um, and I was working full time, I just decided strategically this would be the best place for me to sit for it personally. Right. So now having passed that bar, you're now eligible to wave into New York, New Jersey, South Carolina, a bunch of states. I mean, I mm -hmm. probably 10 or, or 15 or so. I think it's it's 13. <laughs> 13. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. So there you go. Two, so 13 states, which is pretty exciting. On the other hand, I remember when you contacted me to start talking about this idea of, of taking the bar again. Um and you know, and you're working full time. What was that like for you? I mean, what what did you have to kind of go through mentally and emotionally to to psych up again? Well, I had to tell my firm, um, and I told them around May, and they were not. They were they seemed accommodating um, because the first time I took it and was working full time, I wasn't working for a firm, yeah. so I thought this would be a little bit better. It wasn't. Um, I still had to hit my billables. They still, um, gave me a hard time about taking it, um, a little bit, even though strategically it would have helped them too. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was just really hard to figure out time management because when you're working eight hours, but you're billing like 10 a day, mm -hmm. um, well, other way around, you're working like 10, you're billing I so. eight. <laughs> I hope so, otherwise we've got um, no problem here. Right. Working like 10 or 12 yeah. and you're billing like yeah. eight, it's yeah. really hard to find at least, or carve in at least three to four hours where you can study. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and everybody else is studying right. eight to 10 hours a day. I mean, if yeah. you're doing it full time. Yeah. As what you're so doing how did you do that? Easier. So how did you do it? Um, I worked a little bit in the mornings. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I would listen to lectures um, in the car. Mm -hmm. So I listen to your countdown lectures and like part of the normal lectures. Mm -hmm. And since this is my second time taking it, well, well, it's my fourth time taking a bar exam, but second right. time passing, um, I actually remembered a lot of the material. Yeah. So once it became about six to eight weeks before the actual exam, I just started really drilling the MBE because I know that that's what saved me last time yeah. when I took Florida. So that's really what I focused on. And it was basically the intuitive approach. <laughs> I remember talking to Kelly in the coaching sessions and I was like, I don't know why I'm getting this right, but I'm getting it right. Yeah. Let's talk about the intuitive <laughs> approach because this is a big deal. And it's something that we developed over a period of time. And essentially what we're saying with this approach is that we want you to read the question and the answer choices carefully, but then decide immediately, right? You didn't sit there and try and analyze or figure them out. Am I correct? Yeah, not really. And I tend to do it a little bit different um, than your typical. And I don't even look at the answer choices first. So I'll look at the question and I'll write like with my little pencil, whatever I think it is. So let's say I think it's perjury. Mm -hmm. And then once you take your hand off, like it's usually there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a pretty cool feeling, isn't it? When it's there, yeah. it's like, oh man, okay. Uh, I yeah, got that. Like, What's yeah. the highest charge? And you're like, well, murder. Yeah. <laughs> and then you look and it's common law murders there. Then there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think that using that approach uh, obviously was good for you. It helped you. Uh, and and so you're able to, to practice and kind of gear up for that. And I thought that was good. Now, you mentioned Kelly. And for those that don't know, 
we offer uh, in our course, you are in our basic coaching program. Mm -hmm. And so you participated in weekly group coaching calls, I guess, as you were able to, with a member of our staff, Kelly, uh, who runs those with, with other uh, students preparing for the exam and just talking about accountability and encouragement and kind of the things that are going on. Did you find those sessions helpful? Yeah, I did. I would usually um, call from the library over at um, the university where I was studying and I would just like run out yeah. and do the calls because they were all scheduled for a certain time. Right. And that's really when I studied the most was during the weekends and the calls were on the weekends. Right. Um, so I was at the library like the whole day, yeah. Saturday, the whole day, Sunday. So you were pretty intense about this. You're working, you're studying, you're doing all this. When did you start your studies for this uh, last exam? I started them late because I remember you telling me like you're, you need to be, yeah, yeah. you need to get on it because it's kind of late. Um, so you got to understand that Patricia and I have an interesting relationship over the years. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, Patricia is one of my favorite people, like probably in the world. Um, but I also am really hard on her because I found, at least it's been my experience, that when I expect more of you, I get more. I don't know. But, you know, because when you came to me, you were pretty well wrecked. And and we sort of put you back together, <laughs> you know, not, not like Humpty yeah. Dumpty, but, but we really had to rebuild your confidence and rebuild your approach. And I found that the more I said to you, honestly, you can do this, you're capable, you would respond, you would, you would make that happen. And so my feeling was when you came back and said, I want to do the DC bar, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's picked a really tough UBE. A 266 is a daunting number, uh, but I believe you can do it. And so I set the goal really high and hard and said, okay, you got to go for it. You got to put in this number of hours, knowing that you're the kind of person that would go, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and you it did. Was, I think it was, it was May. It was late. Yeah, it was. It was. For July. It was, I only had about three months and while working, it's, it's really not three months when you're working full time. No. So <laughs> that was kind of rough. And then, um. Yeah, I just sort of started basically doing everything. And I actually was kind of annoyed with myself because I didn't get through the entire syllabus, like through the review part. I got through all of the substantive, right? but not, I wouldn't, I wanted, I told Kelly, I was like, I wish I had another two weeks, week and a half. Well, I think you did it just right. Uh, <laughs> you know, you got the score you needed and boom, you ran, yeah. right? Now, yeah. you used a tool this time around that we didn't have uh, back in 2014, and that's the paraliminals, right? Yeah, I used them towards the end just to calm myself down. Can you talk a little bit about the paraliminals, what they are and how you use them? So they're from Paul Sheely and Learning Strategies, and they're basically... <sighs> Well, now it's it's kind of companies and stuff are using it, but I, I liken it to mindfulness mm -hmm. in a way. Because yeah. you listen to them and you get quiet and you just kind of get in a different headspace. Um, and it really helps if you have anxiety or even if you're just having a rough day. They're, they're really yeah. good, even beyond studying. Yeah. Um, there, there is a paraliminal called anxiety, right? Um, yes. And the idea behind the, the paraliminals is that you have one voice in one ear and another voice in or another soundtrack in the other ear going cross brain. Uh, to uh, speak to your conscious mind and your non-conscious mind. And they take about, what, 20, 30 minutes, right, to listen 20, to? 20, 30 minutes. Um, a lot of the ones that I was using were even shorter, like the 10-minute supercharger. Yeah. Um, I think I did that one, like, every day for the yeah. last two weeks. And those really helped just calm me down. Yeah. Yeah, they're really great tools. And um, I think they were really called for in your case. I thought it was a great way for us to kind of get you into that mindfulness. That's a great way of expressing it so that you could be really optimal on the exam and have the energy and the focus that you needed, right, to be successful. Yeah. Because I think those are the things that, that come together. Yeah. Um, so what was it like? You go back now, you, you've been to the Florida bar, you've been through that, that zoo. Now you show up in D.C. Talk to us a little bit about what the D.C. exam was like. Okay, so I was in the accommodations room, and a lot anything that could go wrong went wrong with this exam. So I was pretty excited when I passed. Um, they only gave us less than 72 hours notice for the laptop registration, which I missed because it went to my spam folder. Mm. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to have to handwrite this. Um, and I'm friends with some judges on Twitter, and they were like, everybody used to handwrite, so calm down. You'll be fine, which... I've never handwritten a bar exam, so I was nervous about that. 
But then when I showed up, I realized I have a MacBook that has a touch bar, which isn't and really touch a bar was it, Yeah, and they couldn't deal with the touch bar. Thank no. you, ExamSoft. These guys are, they're a trip, aren't they? Was, was not allowed. And then I also noticed some people had the regular MacBook, the little 12 inch, that doesn't have a USB port and you needed a USB port. So I was like, okay, well, thank God I'm just handwriting. And it was kind of nice because they let us go early if you hand wrote. Because mm -hmm. you didn't have to do any of the exam soft protocol. Right. Yeah. Um, the proctors kept giving us the wrong directions for every section for both days. They kept kept giving the wrong directions. Um, then a proctor's phone went off several times. Mm -hmm. We did not have a digital clock. We had an analog clock that that's, didn't yeah, seem that's, to work that's well. The, that's the famous DC piece is that they don't and, give you a digital clock. For no. reasons unbeknownst, but yeah. the other rooms had one. Yeah. We did not. Yeah. Um, and the t start time was off, so it'd be like seven fifty three a.m. ish until. And then <laughs> I, I took about like five minutes just to be like, well, where do I need to go with my pacing? Yeah. Um, because that's I think that's really key to the MBE. Yeah. Um, is pacing yourself and not taking too long on anything. Um, and then that was basically it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really pretty weird. It's pretty, um, it's pretty non-professional, frankly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Compared okay. to Florida, it was. Yeah. yeah. I'll say that. You don't have to say it, but I'll say it. So you could go to the bathroom. On super it was very different. Yeah. yeah. Um, very casual. So if, so if you're looking for, if you're forum shopping, if you're jurisdiction shopping, DC is small, it's informal, it's generally fouled up. Uh, it's totally, um, just kind of non-professional. Uh, but if you can get past all of that, um, it's good <laughs> and you get the same score and then you can wave into all these other states, which is what makes the UBE so wonderful right now. There's, there's portability that there's never been before. Now, behind all of this, I wanna just talk about sort of the underlying question, which is that as an Hispanic woman, we do not see many Hispanics, uh, women, in the practice of law these days. And I, I, I asked before we started if you were willing to talk a little bit about this. I know it's a sensitive subject generally, but I think it's something that needs to be discussed because it, it is in fact part of the challenge here uh, in, in finding work, in, in getting into law and, and doing this. And can you speak to that just a little bit in terms of what your experience has been like? Um, yeah, well, I'm in a really specific market in South Florida. So most of the law that's going on down here um, is first party property yeah. and litigation. So you're getting lots of mortgage foreclosure litigation. Um, some of those are closing out. Um, lots of personal injury protection litigation, which now they busted a ring of plaintiff's attorneys for that. So I don't know what's happening there. Um, and first party property, which is pipe leaks and roof leaks and hurricane leaks, yeah. which is sort of what I have been doing, um, which was not what I went to law school for. So what did you want to do when you were in law school? I wanted to do transactional law. Okay. For the All most right. part. Yeah. Okay. And were there many, I mean, in your experience, have you seen a lot of other Hispanic women in law school or in the practice of law? Um, I've seen a few, but I think it's because of where I'm at, which is South Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've seen a lot. There's a few Hispanic judges down here mm -hmm. um, and attorneys. But I think at least I know a lot of people who are in my practice area have kind of been like, this isn't what I went to law school for. Yeah. I'm not helping anybody. Yeah. Um, and litigation is, in my experience, just not it does it's not very fulfilling not to no. not to do no, not no. to speak ill of litigators, but at least the kind I was doing was just yeah. not. Yeah. Um, that fulfilling so and, and so I, I think it takes a lot of courage when you're when you've got a job and you're there and knowing that you know you want to do more right uh, yeah. and that's kind of what I've, I've come to, to know about you over the years is that you you're a quiet uh, but very determined individual and so it didn't particularly surprise me when you said you know what if the way that I break out of this bubble that I'm in is to do a different bar and open it up. I'm going to do that, even though that's hard and it's expensive and it's it's a lot of work. Um, I mean, is that part of your thinking is that that was how you would expand your opportunity? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's why I chose to take um, a uniform bar because I had also looked at taking Pennsylvania, but they're not uniform because um, I went to school, to law school in Pennsylvania. And then I found out all the stuff about the UBE and more states are adopting it every 
year, it seems like. So I just felt like for me as an opportunity um, and for career growth, that was basically probably the best option because Florida right now is just kind of, it's a very difficult market. Yeah, it really is a difficult market. And and I know that we're going to have people watching this interview, Patricia, who uh, might be in a similar situation, they, Hispanic or women or both. Uh, what would you say to them as they're kind of looking at their options and, and what's going on in the, the field? I mean, I think there's definitely positions out there. Mm -hmm. um, I've just started looking because now I can wave into certain states like New York, New Jersey, yeah. obviously D.C., um, there are jobs in what I want to do or mm -hmm. would want to do. Mm -hmm. They're just not geographically where I'm located. Um, and that's the thing about the bar is for some time, like if you're specifically Florida and I think California too, you are geographically limited Yeah. if you don't have another one. Yeah. Um, Cause there's several positions that say it's fine, apply, but you need to have the ability to wave in, which yeah. I didn't have that before yeah. two last Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Changes the field, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it can really, I've spoken to some older attorneys and you can kind of get into a, a rut with practice. Um, there are several attorneys I've met who that what I was doing was not what they wanted to do, but they started and 25 years later, they're still there. Yeah. They're very unhappy. Yeah. Um, and I think if you can, it's, it's three months out of your life to take another bar exam and maybe um, open a I mean, a ton of doors for you and your family, then why not do it? Um, and that's just the way I look at it. Yeah, I think that's great advice. You know, I do talk to some of those 25 and 30 uh, year practice attorneys who realize that they've sort of hit the dead end and they're now making the switch. And I would say it's almost more difficult in some cases for them to stop or carry on their practice and study for the bar at the same time. Uh, some of them are coming to Florida, but a lot of them are leaving as well. So, so it's really challenging, uh, undoubtedly. And I think that you you create a really good roadmap for people uh, in in showing what's possible and what can be done when you when you put your head down and decide to do it. Um, share with me what it was like on Wednesday when the results came out. I know that you had uh, contacted us to say, I think they're coming out on Wednesday. And then it was like, what time is it going to be? Like twelve o'clock, one o'clock, whatever? Because DC. Yeah. God knows. Was, you never know. I think it was Thursday. Yeah. Like they said one o'clock. They yeah. did not come out at one o'clock. No. The website went down. <laughs> um, people can get on. Um, yeah, it, it was just kind of a mess. And then finally, yeah. I had someone who else who I took the exam with text me congratulations. And that's how I found out I passed. That's a nice feeling, huh? Yeah. So yeah, I didn't. You didn't even have to look at the page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and so, and what's your family say? They're pretty excited and proud, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you've had quite a journey from Pennsylvania down to Florida, now having these open opportunities. If you were talking about the, the ideal position in law for you right now, what do you think it would be? What would you like to do? Um, I ideally would want to do transactional law, either for a firm or in-house for a company. Mm -hmm. Um specifically just dealing with contracts. That's my favorite thing. So yeah, yeah, I think that's what I would want to do for the, for the most part. And there's, there's a lot of positions doing that. Um, they're just not located where I'm located. So there you go. Bye. That's it. So I think it was, I think it was a great career move, great uh, strategy on your part. Um, definitely a lot of work and a lot of determination and dedication. Did you feel any sense of fear that, oh my gosh, it was so tough to get through the Florida exam. Now here I am putting myself back in jeopardy, if you will, to do that all over again. Yeah. Um, especially because I had to fly from Florida to DC just to take this exam and then fly back. Yeah. Um, and I was like, this is like a ton of money. And if I didn't pass, I was, it was just going to be pretty devastating and annoying. But at the same time I was working. So I was like, I didn't really have that much time yeah. to study as much as I would have wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for those working at the same time, I would definitely start earlier. Um, yeah, I think it would be nice. <laughs> it would have helped. Yeah. 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 Um, um, what can you tell people about Celebration Bar Review? I mean, you've used us now a couple of times successfully. I, we often get questions where people say, you know, um, are, are the testimonials real? <laughs> you're, you're real, right? Yeah, no <laughs> yeah. person. We're not paying um, you to do this. Uh, no. no. <laughs> okay, all right, so we've cleared that up. But what, what would you tell somebody who's asking? 
Well, I was a bar rep for another bar review in law school. Um, who I know I did that. Not, yeah. Who I did not pass with. Um, I think you guys are really good for people that are repeaters mm -hmm. that don't necessarily have the learning style of a the big box bar review, which is just the same. It's a one size fits all for everybody. Yeah. Um, you're definitely better for anybody who's working. <laughs> Um, and has a family and needs flexibility in their schedule because the way the big box bar reviews are, for the most part, it's eight hours a day of you in a lecture hall yeah. over and over again. Um, and you really encourage, I think, a lot more practice on the exams and definitely on the writing than I've experienced anywhere else. And I really just like all you actually give feedback. <laughs> Which we try <laughs> a lot of, yeah but a lot of bar reviews it's just you get some sort of graded note that's redlined but you don't actually know yeah. how your writing style needs to change um and yeah i think that's for the most part well thanks the best part. and I, the I mean, community the I'm community sorry. on facebook this time which i didn't have last time was yeah. really nice even though i wasn't that active because i'm not i don't have a facebook um, so I made one just for the bar review. All right. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So I would go on every once in a while and I used Check that it out. Yeah. the yeah. coaching calls with Kelly. Um, I think the community is really great because you see there's other people taking it that yeah. aren't just you or yeah. the people you went to law school with, which is also nice to get out of that same like section law yeah, school out of that bubble. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Patricia, we are so pleased for you. We're so proud of you. Um, you know, I, I wish we had those two-time, you know, letters or jackets, you know, when you're, yeah. a <laughs> you know, it's like Saturday Night Live. You're a two-timer now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're really pleased. And I know that this, you took a risk by doing this and it paid off big. And I know it's going to pay off for you and giving you the opportunity to do the things you want to do. And, you know, I, I think you know us well enough to recognize how important it is uh, here at Celebration Bar Review to recognize diversity in the legal profession, to uh, recognize diversity in the practice of law. Uh, and so it's it's just particularly sweet when we see someone who has really broken through some barriers, and you really have uh, on a couple of different levels at a couple of different times. And we just are so appreciative that we get to be with you on that journey. Um, I know that you're interview with me today will inspire people. I know that your comments uh, back in 2014 inspired a lot of people. And uh, your story is a great one and it's inspiring. And I think it really proves that you can do it if you just keep at it, if you just don't give up. And you are a great example of perseverance and dedication and finding the right solutions. And uh, man, that's just awesome stuff. So we wish you all the best. I, I think with that 266, we probably won't see you for any more bar exams unless you decide you want to go to California. Uh, but, <laughs> I, you know, who knows, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, really do wish you well as, as you go forward. I hope you'll stay in touch with us. I will. Thank you. All right. Thanks to, to you and thanks to all of you in our audience for being with us. We'll be back again next time with another interview with a successful bar taker. And for now, we'll sign off. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>